What's up guys, today I'm bringing you back another Q&A, so if you have any questions, post yours down below and let's begin. Hey Alex, I'm curious to know if life responsibilities ever interfere with your training and how do you deal with it. Thing is, my life and training are highly interconnected in a way that doesn't apply to most. What I mean is, every time I work out, no exceptions, which has been true for the last two years, lights and camera are on me. I can't not film. I need to get B-roll footage, otherwise, you're gonna end up with that old school content where it's just a talking head, not much editing going into this. So I have a responsibility as a fitness influencer to give you the best quality of which I'm capable of. And sometimes that will require an accumulation of many workouts, otherwise my own training suffers. So beyond that, okay, we all go out, we have family responsibilities, you just adjust the time at which you train. So if I'm going out for a supper, I will work out in the afternoon. I know some people don't have that privilege, because maybe they work an office job or they're out somewhere. Well, I'm on my computer most of the day and this home gym is a 10 second walk away. So it doesn't matter. I don't have to drive to the gym. I don't have to wait around for others. I'm totally independent and free to work out whenever I so please, including when the gym's closed, which in my area is 10 o'clock. So let's say I do come back late. It's 11 o'clock, midnight, around there. I'm gonna get a workout in. Of course, I'll wait till my food is digested. Otherwise, I might actually throw up or it'll be very difficult to muster through it. But I'm never going to skip the session, even if it's late, because I go to bed late anyway. Now, there are times where it will be a weekend and you really don't want to train. But you do it anyway, early on. It is what it is. But after that, you got the rest of the day. So basically, discipline plus the fact that I really don't have a choice <laughs> gets me to do this. Like I've been working out hard for over 10 years now and I can confidently state that there hasn't been a single time in that journey where I went a month off. I think the max I ever did was three weeks, but even then it could have been two and a half weeks. I deload of course. I have my mini vacations like everybody else and certain obligations that I don't share on this channel because this is not about me. It's about me trying to help you achieve your fitness goals, but there's never any excuses. So it really doesn't matter what's going on in my life. In fact, there were times where I was extremely depressed. Nothing was going my way and it was one bad event after another. I still trained. There've been times where I've been sleeping four to five hours a night. I still got my ass over to the gym, sacrificing sleep, which is the furthest thing from optimal. And I don't recommend that, but you know, it just goes to show that you can always find a way to train. I don't care what equipment you have, how tired you are, what your schedule looks like. You can always do something. And even if you get very, very little gains or you're maintaining at best, that's the best alternative compared to shrinking and not going anywhere. Plus it's the pattern that you're building. The habit of being a fit person is gonna do this for the rest of their life. So my response to you is, I don't even think about this. I don't care what's going on in my life. Whether it's good or bad, I'm gonna go to the gym. And because I happen to do this for a living, it makes things a little bit more convenient compared to others. So I do consider myself to be blessed in this regard, and it's all due to you guys. You allow me to make my dreams possible. And for that, I will eternally be grateful. What volume should back off sets be for deadlifts, or should I just go to straight accessory work after them? It depends if your goal is general strength or just hypertrophy. In my case, I never do back off sets on deadlifts. It's always going to be an accessory variation of it, like a Romanian deadlift, either with the same bar that I was using before. So if I'm doing a conventional deadlift, it's gonna be a straight bar RDL, just makes things easier. Or if I'm doing trap bar as a first deadlift, then it's gonna be a trap bar RDL or with dumbbells. I like to pair it that way. Or I can just do good mornings, which will provide a very similar stimulus to the posture chain. And truth be told, that's what I do at least eight out of 10 times. Like most of the year, my training has been good mornings, not RDLs, even though those are freaking amazing. So it's really up to you. If your goal is powerlifting, I would do back offsets between 75 and 85%. I don't really like high repetitions on dead stop hip hinges, which is what a deadlift is, but if you're just trying to get generally strong and jacked, and in my opinion, this is more feasible for the majority of my audience, you can do 70% around there anyway on good mornings. 
I like being around 65%, leaving more reps in reserve, just because I don't wanna go to failure on movements like that. So that's what I would say. If it's a deadlift, you should be in the five to eight rep range, and if it's a good morning or RDL, be in the eight to 12 rep range, sometimes even 15 to 20 if it's a volume day. I've been training for a few years and I've met all the goals that I want to achieve and I'm looking to go into maintenance mode. What's the minimum volume I should do per body part in order to preserve my muscle? I would still train in a similar way, maybe just dial back your intensity ever so slightly. So if you're just doing failure or leaving a rep in the tank, leave three to four reps in reserve. And instead of maybe hitting all the positions for a given muscle, you can cut it back to one or two tops. So maybe you were doing a bicep specialization phase. You finally got the arms you wanted and you're doing three curls at the time. Well, maybe now you can cut it back to two, maybe even one. It depends how far you're willing to take this minimalist perspective because that's kind of what it is. And the thing is, you can maintain for a long time following even bad programming, which is what I personally did in 2018 for my legs. I was doing pistol squats, lunges with a sandbag. I got away with that for the majority of the year. But I would say in the last five months or so, that's when the legs noticeably shrank. And that's when I realized, yeah, this ain't gonna work anymore. So you have to be careful with that, not to mention potential overuse and losing your resiliency. So all I can really say is don't overthink this too much and you can be on the lower end of the weekly volume recommendations. So if you're getting 20 sets a week per body part, try 10. You'll have no problems maintaining muscle with that. Or you can go even more extreme than that because a lot of guys will tell you, you can maintain a muscle with five sets a week. Heck, what if we look at something like heavy duty training where you're doing one set per major compound movement? Your total volume will 100% of the time be under 10 sets, yet some guys are gaining even more muscle doing this. So in truth, you don't need a tremendous amount of volume to maintain. And it's very hard for me to tell you exactly how many sets you'll need, but if I were in your position, I would, for legs, train them once a week, only hitting a squat and a good morning, not even isolating, even though that would be the furthest thing from optimal. For my pressing muscles, if I just did flat bench and overhead press with maybe some chin-ups, can probably maintain a good amount of muscle, though I'm someone who actually needs isolation, so maybe one curl, one tricep push down, you're good with that once or twice a week. Like, I don't even want to attempt to say what you should do precisely because there's so much variance depending on how you train previously. But all you really need is a common sense approach and realizing that natty muscle is an absolute joke to maintain, even if you fuck it up. And keep in mind, if you do lose, you'll gain back the muscle quickly. Like, you can get shredded to the bone and within three months, you'll get all your muscle back, at least the majority of it. So <laughs> if you're gonna just train in a subpar fashion, but you're still eating a good amount, you're not even trying to get single digit, then who cares what happens? Like you'll figure out with time, yeah, I can't really get away with this particular approach. I might need to add slightly more volume. So that's all I'm gonna say for that. Though you, you probably don't need as much volume as you think, okay? And I certainly don't want you to embrace laziness now. You said carries build your traps through the way to stretch, but I was taught to maintain a bit of a shrug during carries. Do you think it's better to not shrug then? I don't think you have to shrug. Just look at the deadlift. No one has been taught to shrug while doing the pole, yet everyone reports trap gains from getting stronger at that movement, provided that you get some really good numbers. And so this could be extended to the farmer walk. When the weight is really heavy, you're probably not gonna maintain this shrug position, which is also fatiguing because you're in the short position, right? So in my opinion, if you wanna incorporate that element, I think it's much smarter to do regular dumbbell shrugs of failure immediately followed by farmer walks. At least now your muscles failed in the short position and now you can extend that set through the length and just getting the weight of stretch in. That is a far better option and probably something I'd recommend to a lot of you who wanna get yoked. Don't combine both into the same movement because then you're really getting a compromising effect. Not to mention that there's no dynamic motion in that. It's not just a squeezing aspect, it's squeezing plus full range of motion. So do what I said, you're gonna get a lot better gains. And don't worry so much about farmer walk form. It's a very simple exercise. You're just walking with weight in your hands. It doesn't have to be technical, bro. Stability question. What are your thoughts on a one-arm landmine press as an upper chest builder when you press across your chest? There tends to be instability at the end of the range of motion. I tend to think that's a good thing. 
It's actually not. And one of the reasons why I completely stopped doing landmine presses. It used to be a big part of my program back in 2016. And what I noticed is that the carryover to other presses was really low. Not to mention the fact that it was hard to make progress on it. And now that I understand biomechanics, I know why. For one, the strength curve is god awful. Like one of the worst you're ever going to encounter. So just off that, you should be defaulting to inclines <laughs> with a barbell, dumbbell, machine, whatnot, right? And the second thing is the instability. This lowers your force output. And with the landmine, it's rather significant because there's a lot of lateral forces you have to overcome. Even if you try to perfectly center yourself, when you're one arm at a time, it's going to do this. And the perception of effort goes up, but the motor unit recruitment of the primary movers isn't as high as it could be. So you'll get less of a hypertrophic response off that. Paired with the resistance profile and you have a bad recipe for hypertrophy. Not saying you won't get gains now. You take that two plate, one arm landmine press to three, your shoulders and upper chest will grow. But is it an efficient way of doing so? Are there infinitely better options? You better believe it. And even the squeeze you're talking about is not that great. Like you're better off using cables or bands if you want to hit the shore in position. So something that Coach Kasim talks about is the press around, in this case being the clavicular version. So set a cable even with your forearms coming from the bottom and just, so not like a cable crossover where you're doing this, leave a bend in your arm and allow that freaking squeeze to happen much better than doing the landmine version in terms of peak tension at the top. So this is not really an exercise I'm going to be promoting much moving forward, unless you're doing a Viking press for strongman purposes or trying to work your back with the landmine station, which is a very different discussion. Do you think that only doing bodyweight calisthenics rings or bars will require higher volume and frequency compared to weighted calisthenics? Like instead of 10 to 20 sets at RP eight to 10 a week, is more like 15 to 25 at RP eight to 10. You see, man, the RPE is identical. This is what you specified. Meaning, so are the hypertrophy outcomes. You don't need to do more sets just because it's body weight. Your body doesn't give a Resistance is resistance. And the proximity to failure is the number one variable that equals the gains. So if you're doing body weight pull-ups, 15 repetitions at RPE eight, you won't gain any less muscle from that compared to going a little bit heavier doing RP8 with eight repetitions on the weight aversion. Maybe you have like 20 pounds off your waist, which means that a lot of people are probably going weighted a little bit sooner than they should be. See, it gets inefficient when you get really strong at the pull-ups. In my case, I can do over 30. And what does the research show? When you're below 35% of your one rep max, that's when the net outcome is not equal. In that case, I would propose that, yeah, you probably do need more sets. And even when we talk about lower rest intervals and down workouts where you're doing a crazy amount of repetitions, 500 to 1,000 push-ups, yes, that's when you're correct. But assuming that the RPEs are close enough and you're not in those super high rep ranges, then you don't really have to worry about adding more volume. So if your goal is to just build muscle and you're doing bodyweight pull-ups, you get 15, 12, 10 across three sets. You're good. You actually don't need to strap on weight. Though we could argue that it's still a little bit better to go weighted because it'll be less fatigue when you're in those lower rep ranges. And you'll probably get more strength gains as a result. So the specificity to consider, but from a pure mass gaining standpoint, no. Hey Alex, I want to start off by saying your videos are the best fitness content on YouTube and that I've made amazing gains following your advice. So thanks. Awesome, man. Anyways, I want to know what is your thoughts on creatine and supplements in general? Do you recommend them? Do you think someone can still reach their maximum potential without them? So creatine is probably the only supplement that actually works. So I probably would recommend it to the majority of my audience. Now, do I take it? Yes, it's on and off. Though I will state that there were times where I made the best gains of my life without using creatine. And this year it's been extremely inconsistent. I'll go days without even using it. Actually, my 507 squat journey when I was peaking towards the end, no creatine. 405 bench, I don't think I was using it either at the very end. So food is the real answer. If you're in a calorie surplus, you're gonna maximize your gains. And in the case of protein powder, I've had protein sitting in my cupboard for over a year now. It's really a convenience thing. So. I'm not one of those guys who's anti-supplements on the basics, 
but I will acknowledge that there's nothing magical about them because all they can really do is supplement what can already be obtained through normal food consumption. So if you're tracking your macros and you see that your protein is adequate, why are you then going to incorporate a protein shake within that day if it wasn't necessary? And considering the demands are so low, being only 0.8 per pound of body weight, many days you can skip it. So I would say that I probably only take protein powder about once a month, if that, because most of my days, the diet is good. It's really if you're in a pickle per se. So yeah, you don't need any supplements to reach your maximum potential. Just look at the old school greats, for example, in the bronze and silver era. A lot of them just ate and trained hard. You can do the same. So I really wouldn't put a lot of time and energy researching them because trust me, you will waste a lot of money on those who claim you'll get additional benefits. Like I said, most don't work. Hey Alex, at what point do you think once you start using the conjugate system for deadlifts and how? My rep is 350 for five at 140. Body weight progress aren't the stall. Yeah, no shit, bro, you're strong for that body weight. Do you think I could start implementing or should I continue milking the linear gains a bit longer? Okay, so first of all, that is amazing pound for pound strength. You should be proud of yourself. What I would tell you is because you're only 140, you're probably lean to the point where you're sabotaging your own linear progression. Enter a calorie surplus. I know you're not in one and you'll be able to milk that linear progression even longer. I would say it's quite realistic for you to get 405 for five at 150 pounds. But if you refuse to do so, you're gonna stall at this body weight. So in my opinion, yeah, you should continue to milk the linear gains. Don't run something that's more advanced when you don't need to. And that's something that always puzzles me when viewers ask me this question. They're still getting great gains for the most basic of basic approaches ever, yet they wanna rush into something that is gonna be slower progress and is already a yearly grind. Like, I've been doing the conjugate concurrent style since the summer of 2014. I wish that I could have started that in say 2016, that I would have had another two years of basic linear progression. Didn't work out that way. So <laughs> this has been the majority of my lifting journey, truth be told. It's been the style that you see me preach time and time again. Trust, bro, you're gonna have all the time in the world to get deep in the woods with this. So please, man, just enjoy what you're going through right now. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You're never gonna get this ever again. And you're gonna miss those days of rapid linear progression. So gain a little bit of weight, stop being so stubborn with that, Up the abs for a little bit, okay? And you'll be able to milk this for quite a bit longer. I'm thinking about having an arms and shoulder day since they're a bit lagging. Do you recommend putting at least one compound or just purely isolation. Also, are you a fan of influencer boxing? So for the arms and shoulder day, that's popular among many natural lifters like Jeffrey Verity Schofield and was a thing, especially in the golden era of bodybuilding. So I, I think it's absolutely valid and I would probably consider this as well as someone who's rather torso dominant. Now, should you do a compound movement? Debatable. One can say that if you only did lateral raises on that day with maybe some rear delt, followed by direct arm work, maybe three curls and three tricep movements, that you'd be good to go. I'm somewhat inclined to agree with that, but I still think it's probably a good idea to do an overhead press, at least just one compound. You don't need a tremendous amount. So on your, I'm assuming chest and back day, there will be no vertical pressing. So if that movement pattern is not in your system, why not include it on your shoulder and arm day? I guess the only consideration would be if you're under-recovered in the sense that if you're doing chest and back, legs, and then shoulders and arms, it's 48 hours apart. So maybe you're not ready to do an OHB. And in that case, isolation could make more sense. But despite that, it's still probably a good idea to throw in. Again, not mandatory, but that's what I would say. You don't need more than one compound. Though because of my lack of experience using this kind of split, I don't know what's best for you. So I would just say experiment, see what works for your recovery. If you notice that the OHB is affecting you for your next chest and back session, which again, it's always gonna be at a high frequency, then maybe drop it. Again, it's not necessary to do that in the first place. Hey Alex, two questions. One, when running conjugate style, how often do you recommend cycling around the main comp lifts on max effort? I usually go for every eight weeks. Two, 
programming variations of max effort lifts, you specifically program right down the exact lift or do you go with something more vague, example squat variation, thanks. Regarding how frequently you should do the comp lift, eight weeks can work, though I prefer spacing it out even more, maybe around 12 weeks. Though if I'm being completely honest with you, I usually go even longer than this, like going five or six months without doing it a single time because I trust that when I go back to it, there's gonna be an instant PR. So during the four or five bench journey, I maxed out one time, four or five. Everything else was just variation. So that was a six month process. How about this year? We're gonna be in September. Can you guess how many times I've maxed out on the regular bench? Zero times, because it's not necessary. And this is how Louis Simmons used to prescribe it. However, if we talk about the squat, I've done it three times in the whole year. So within eight months, I did 425, 440, and 507. But again, I probably didn't even have to. I bet if I would have scrapped those two other attempts, I would have still gotten the same squat in the end, just by doing variation. So this is not something that you even have to do. I suppose you'd be interested in this if you just wanna get a gauge of where your progress is at, or you lack a number of variations. But in my case, if I can go back in time, I'd probably do a banded squat instead. So look, man, as long as it's not too frequent, you're gonna be okay. So I would say eight is probably the lowest I would go. Why is it that 65 to 70% is incredibly easy for me to do on a three by 10 bench? I can probably do a three sets of 18 to 20 at 65% with a three sets of 15 to 18 at 70. For reference, I have terrible bench leverages, elbow bends like you couldn't even imagine, lol. See, that's what makes it even more impossible because if you have bad bench leverages, then even 65% should be challenging. So what this tells me is that 190 pounds, which is the one where Max you specified right after, is not your true max. You lack the skill and coordination element to properly display your strength. You're capable of a lot more, probably at least 225. So if you really wanna get accurate like this, keep in mind you're still a lean novice. If you run a powerlifting peaking program for one month, that'll determine what your real max is. You don't really have experience with going heavy like this. You probably tested it one time out of the blue and by default, that is not your peak performance. So you're basing this off a submaximal single. And then you also have to factor in your form on the back downs. Is it touch and go? Because that can make a big difference. Assuming both were paused, you're not gonna get 20 reps at the percentages you're talking about. It's just not gonna happen. So there's definitely something wrong here. When this is done correctly, which a lot of my intermediate advanced lifters have reported, the best case scenario is you'll have three reps in reserve, not in five to 10 reps in reserve. No. Alex, what max effort lower body variations would you recommend for a long arm, long femur, short torso, conventional deadlifter? Thanks. So you basically have the perfect build for this exercise and therefore you can handle higher percentages than most people and should probably stay away from partials because what you're doing is already somewhat of a partial in the sense that you're less bent forward, your leverages are optimized. You're someone who would need to do a lot of deficit variations or just stick to pulling from the ground. I'd say block pulls are probably a bad idea for you or just rack pulls. Even the accommodating resistance, you'll have to go with a very light tension, 20 to 30 pounds of chains, tops, even micro mini bands, one to two inch deficit pulls, probably mixing in the competition movement a bit more frequently than others. You're someone who can get away with a bit more specificity. So I would just look at the range of motion factor. It should be normal and extended the majority of times. As long as you do that, you should be in a good position. Thoughts on using hammer curls exclusively to build forearms. Depends how good your forearm genetics are, but hammer curls are a great way of developing the brachial radialis right here. And that can make your forearm look a lot more massive than it actually is, you know? So the top part definitely adds on to that illusion. But what most people are actually lacking in is the forearm flexors. And for that, you need wrist flexion. It's this area right here that you gotta develop. The meat, the belly. So that's not gonna cut it if you're only doing hammers, unless you're someone who just 
got jacked there from grip work, like barehanded deadlifts and pull-ups. You know, that's not everybody though. In fact, I'd say it's the minority. So yeah, hammer curls are great. Uh, for the bracket radial specifically though, I'd probably do them pinwheel style. It's a little bit better than in front of the body. So across, you can get slightly more of a biasing effect. And then you wanna do direct isolation work where the bicep is not involved. And the best way to do that is by training like an arm wrestler. Any wrist flexion variation will get the job done. It could be the standard one where you're on a bench, it could be with a cable setup. It's a super simple function that doesn't need to be overcomplicated. Hey Alex, what do you think of rotating max effort Larson press week one, then dead bench another week, then close grip Larson, then comp bench. These are the only variations I have. I have a long wingspan with 240 bench. So leverage is aside. I find this is a little bit too specific in the sense that the variations are so close to each other that I would only ever recommend this during maybe a short term peaking phase, like a non competition style peaking phase. And with conjugate, this absolutely works, but this is not something you can sustain for a long period of time. You will 100% suffer from overuse because the strength curves are almost identical. It's all extended range of motion. And most importantly, you're exclusively doing very hard variations of these. So I think you could mix in a little bit more like incline pressing, which would solve the problem completely. And just like I talked about in a previous question, you should limit the competition style bench. Don't do that every four weeks, man. Many times you won't PR and it can be psychologically demotivating. So I like what you're doing with the dead benching, the close grip and the Larson style. But how about you also mix that in with varying angles, you know, incline, decline. Maybe you can invest a little bit of money for some accommodating resistance that would grant you so many variations. Or you can get a small board, like a, a half board or one board, two and one, you know what I'm saying? If using this system, four variations is not gonna cut it in the long term. I'm just keeping it real with you. So in my opinion, you need to get a little bit more creative. You know for a fact, this is not the only thing that you could do. Expand your mind a bit and you're gonna be okay. All right, final question of the week. Hey Alex, do you use barefoot shoes or have any thoughts on them? I do not, but I often train barefoot, which you can clearly see in my Instagram clips. I've been doing this for at least two years now, especially if I'm not gonna do a workout video for you guys. And I absolutely love it. I feel like my feet have become way stronger and I honestly don't need to wear any shoes. It doesn't matter what exercise I'm doing. I feel grounded, stability is fine. And I would also add that for things like deadlifts, I 100% of the time will take off my shoes. So <laughs> that makes you closer to the ground. Barefoot is superior in this case. So yeah, I think a lot of people over obsess about what's the best shoe when they're weak and probably don't even need shoes to begin with. The only time where shoes will make a big difference is for a particular style of squatting where you're trying to maximally bias the quads. In that case, some heel elevation is the way to go. Definitely superior. But for everything else, like I've even seen Matt Winning do bench press with slides on. <laughs> what does that say? That your shoes don't matter as much as you think. So would I wear barefoot shoes? Yeah. If someone sent them out to me and the ones that look the best are by Chris Duffin. He has his whole barefoot brand. They look absolutely phenomenal. I would love to try those out and make an honest review. But as of right now, I'm good either training barefoot with my squat shoes or my simple running shoes. And I know that's considered a sin in many cases to bring that to the gym, but just look at things objectively. For the majority of movements, it's probably not a big deal. So that's my perspective. Hope you guys enjoy this Q&A. Let's see some more questions down below and I'll talk to you all next time.